My submission to you this morning is on the subject of sacrificing for change. Before I get into all of this, I appreciate being a silent listener to all of the presentations and the questions that followed and the comments that followed, and I, uh, I think I'm, I'm a better uh, a person through that process. And so uh, let's make this country a center for artificial intelligence for Africa. And then lead the way to make sure that we have digitalized every aspect of our transactions. Anyone and everyone can have a dashboard and they can see what is going on and why it is not going on sometimes. And talking about sacrifice and patriotism, that's about what I want to address right now. But I'm grateful for a school of government. Through legislation, this is part of what it will take for everyone at Capitol Hill and other places to shape up to the kind of thinking that all of us will need to have. So that's already part of the process of making sure if you can't change the people, change the people. So while I intend to offer my personal reflections for your use within which ever of the seven gates you feel called to safeguard, like Ms. Ndolowe has been invited, and all of you, I also wish to cite scriptures, if you will permit me and use that as my airport to take off or a springboard so that I have that anchoring scripture because I believe it presents us with a perfect role model who paid the ultimate sacrifice to achieve the ultimate change. This is Hebrews chapter number 12, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 1 through 7, and that scripture states, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word? of encouragement that addresses you as a, a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. 
God is treating you as his children. That's the end of that quote. Now, that is God's word. Now, as we think about the sacrifices we must make in order to bring about lasting change in Malawi, this text of scripture spells out for us by telling us <clears throat> plainly three kinds of sacrifice that any lasting change demands. The bottom line is that you must ask yourself as a gatekeeper if you are making these sacrifices in your sphere of arena of influence, an arena of influence, because if you're serious about lasting change, then these are the sacrifices you must make as a gatekeeper in order to achieve it. First, achieving lasting change demands the sacrifice of losing excess weight. When this scripture says we must, quote, throw off everything that hinders, end of quote, the image is that of a person whose movement and progress is being slowed down by excess weight. Excess weight that must be sacrificed or thrown off. It takes sacrifice to lose excess weight. That is slowing you down. Because losing excess weight means losing something that's been become part of you. Something that is attached to you. Something that will hurt you when you burn it off. Or while you burn it off. All you have to do to appreciate the sacrifice it takes to lose excess weight is to go into a gym to lose five kilos. Try it. And immediately you will understand that losing excess weight is a painful sacrifice because it involves putting yourself through the painful process of burning off the attachments that are slowing you down. Within the gate of governance, where I operate, one of the great frustrations and hindrances to lasting change is a culture of slowness that we have accepted across the country and that has infiltrated the public service over the course of the 60 years we've been self-governing people. As a people, we walk at a snail's pace, talk at a snail's pace, work at a snail's pace, and function at a snail's pace. We lack a sense of urgency in many areas because we do not realize that time is never on our side. In fact, we are a, a culture that believes the exact opposite. That entire people Now that's a lie. God may be on our side, but time is never on our side. It's only God who lives outside of time. That's why he is eternal. We are restricted by time. We must accept that each day that we are alive as citizens of this country. And each day that we are operating as gatekeepers of change, we are racing against time. We are racing against time, firstly, because we have no control or guarantees about time. None of us here have any control or guarantee of what will happen 24 minutes from now, much less what will happen 24 hours from now. 
We used to sing, I don't know about tomorrow. But God has been to tomorrow. And secondly, we must see ourselves as racing against time because of the march of evil to stop us from achieving lasting change. Which is why scripture sometimes, you know, has told us to, quote, redeem the time for the days are evil, end of quote. You can only tell yourself that you have time to get things done if there are no evil forces working against you. But that is a luxury we do not have. Evil forces are working in the spiritual realm and using their agents here in the earthly realm to stop and frustrate our efforts. And we need to move with speed to outrun and outmaneuver them. And then thirdly, we must see ourselves as racing against time because we are already behind in our development and progress compared to other countries. And even if the movement has just started and is picking up, 43% is not good enough. And it makes no sense that the person who is starting the race so far behind is also the one who is moving the slowest. So our culture of slowness is based on a lie that we have time. But the truth is that we do not have the time to move slowly. And if we are going to effect change as gatekeepers, we must identify the excess weights that are slowing us down and that we must have brave, uh, we must be brave enough to sacrifice and burn off in order to make ourselves more agile in our progress. Now, for some of us, I know you're following, but you're still up there, and so you're saying, what are you talking about? For some of us, it may be an old system that we are using that slows us down. I find this to be true in my own sphere with respect to the slowness of our procurement system. It is so slow and one of my constant projects is working with Parliament to redesign our procurement system to make it faster. So in your own gates of influence, you need to consider whether there are any systems that we as a nation are attached and addicted to that have become excess weights that need to be sacrificed in order to achieve change. Talk about the issue of digitizing everything, making sure that e-government works. And you know why it is resisted? because it cuts off the other stuff to do with corruption and all. And sometimes, because sin is what brings into effect too many laws, the too many laws become too many stages for corruption. And so that's why e-government must be pursued with the kind of speed and the kind of, of zeal that says we want everything transparent. For some of us, excess weight that needs to be sacrificed and burned off may simply be people that lack the competence and capacity to make things happen quickly. But you should not imagine that getting the wrong people off the boat like excess weight is an easy task. It's not. I think Pastor said, uh, you can say, let's, let's uh, 
leave this old house and, and, and set a new uh, set somewhere because we can't change and say, let's go to Zambia uh, and, and do the experiment. We just have to do with what we got. You understand? But any attempt you make to get the wrong people off the boat will be resisted and fought at every turn and attempts will be made to manipulate you into feeling guilty for moving them off the boat. And if that fails, they will send you envoys to bombard you with appeals for you not to move this person or that person that is slowing down your entire operation. And if the person is someone you like personally, you will feel heavy about the decision to move them away to a more suitable position in order to achieve speed of progress. But that is the kind of sacrifice in terms of losing excess weight that it takes to achieve lasting change. For some of us, the excess weight we need to lose is simply our own bad habit of refusing to enforce consequences for slowness in the places where we operate. And so we ourselves become enablers of slowness. But whatever the excess weight is, that is slowing us down, we must get rid of it because no lasting change can come at the speed we need that change to come while we are holding on to the excess weight we are attached to. Secondly, achieving lasting change demands the sacrifice of repentance. The text here says that for each of us, there are sins that easily entangle us and we must throw them off. The image here is that even if you are an athlete who is fit and who has no excess weight to lose, your progress in achieving change can still be hindered by weeds entangling your legs as you run your race. And the weeds that have the power to do that are your own sinful entanglements. So the question for you as a gatekeeper is one of introspection. As you reflect on your own life and heart, what sins are you most vulnerable to and how do these sins threaten to entangle you? Another way to reflect on it is to do an, um, uh, as a question of feedback. When you look at your own life and heart as a gatekeeper, what sins have you seen or heard others who care about you complain about the most concerning you? And how do those sins threaten to entangle you and hinder your ability to achieve lasting change? All right, it is still on that level of preachy, preachy. Perhaps some of us, it is our own pride and ego that easily entangles us by making us close to new and better ideas that require us to humble ourselves and accept that our own ideas are old and outdated. Or, Maybe for some of us, what the, that pride and ego does to us is to entangle us by making us refuse apologizing to people we have wronged with our own words or actions. Because if there is one thing I have seen, I've seen hinder progress and change in government is roots of bitterness between people whose offices need to work together but who refuse to do so and choose to undermine each other instead because of some personal grievances they have between them, which can easily be resolved by the simple gesture of humbling yourself to make peace with another person. 
For some of us, perhaps the way that pride and ego gets in the way of achieving progress and change is by filling us with the, uh, quote, Buona spirit, end of quote. Where we take our positions as an opportunity to make others work for us while we ourselves are lazy, show up late, leave early, take too many breaks, overuse our privileges, and are generally not as productive as those who report to us. And then we are not achieving as much change and progress as we would if we who are in positions of authority ensured that we occupy our positions as servant leaders who are proud to see others do all or most of the work while we enjoy or just enjoy the benefits and take the credit. So Nehemiah and the rest of his crew, they says, let's be where the work is and participate. Or maybe for some of us, what that pride and ego does to us is to make us feel entitled to things that are not ours, things we have not earned, and things that are meant for the benefit of others. And so this sense of entitlement causes you to start taking an undue advantage of your position by siphoning resources illicitly and rewarding yourself instead of sacrificing yourself in order to achieve lasting change for Malawi. And for some people, it's because the president doesn't make this or that demand, we will do it in his behalf, even if the president doesn't know nothing about it. The assistant. So if you think about it, you will see that pride and ego are at the root of so many of the sins that easily entangle us. Sins that keep us from being at our best to achieve the change that God has called us to. And both these entangling sins and the pride and ego that lie at the root of them require us to sacrifice to place them on the altar of God in repentance so that we can run our race towards change without hindrance. In the ancient world, this idea that your sin is something you have to sacrifice in order to make progress was replayed over and over again through the selection of a spotless animal that you may have liked to keep and the presentation of it to God as a sin offering that you killed and burned at the altar. Why did they select the best? That sacrifice. Today, our altar is the cross where we are called to present our sins to be crucified with Christ so that we can be his ambassadors in his world, in this world, without sinful entanglements. Now we must be prepared to sacrifice the sins that are contributing to our failure to achieve progress in the gates of influence where God has placed us. So these issues of honesty and integrity are not just concepts out there. They must be lived on a day-to-day -day life as we carry our cross. And so I want to be honest. When we have done, we have done. When we haven't done, we haven't done. If they are, even if people would say, oh, no, no, that, you, you just call in uh, up reasons. They must be stated and let people decide. Thirdly, achieving lasting change demands the sacrifice of endurance. 
This is always a difficult concept to champion in this TikTok age of quick reels and quick bites. But we must remember that what we are looking for as gatekeepers is not quick and cosmetic change. Might have been Shakespeare of yesteryear that said, to be or not to be, that is the question. But maybe we can rephrase that and to be and not to seem to be, that is the question. Because lasting and meaningful change that requires commitment and endurance is what we may need for the change not to be just cosmetic. To do the heavy work over the long haul without stopping no matter how difficult it gets. Endurance is a sacrifice we must make as leaders. If it rains while you work, endure it. If it burns while you work, endure it. If it hurts while you work, endure it. If you suffer hunger while you work, endure it. If you suffer exhaustion while you work, endure it. If you suffer ridicule while you work, endure it. If you suffer reproach and public shaming while you work, endure it. If you suffer loneliness while you work, endure it. If you suffer loss while you work, endure it. You cannot achieve meaningful progress and lasting change if you cut and run at the first sign of blood or heat. You cannot achieve meaningful progress and lasting change if you quit and give up in the middle of the marathon just because jogging up the hill hurts your muscles and burns your feet. If there is one character trait, I would encourage and challenge all of us to cultivate as leaders and gatekeepers, it would be this ability to endure. Endurance is in short supply today, especially among leaders, because for a long time in this country, we have entertained the spirit of sulking a spirit of kunyanyala. Leaders and gatekeepers must reject that spirit with extreme prejudice and never allow it to enter them because the spirit of kunyanyala is responsible for the death of so many innovations that could simply not continue because someone decided to quit. The late Vice President, Dr. South Klaus Chirima, had a great saying to encourage young people to be part of the change we are building, saying, Osa topa, osa, uh, osa opa, osa topa, osa fuoka. But I think it is also important to add to that list the word osa nyanyala. <laughs> we cannot build a great nation if we do not have the capacity to endure, to endure crosses as Jesus did, to endure hardship as Jesus did, to endure shame as Jesus did, to endure opposition as Jesus did, to endure discipline as Jesus did, to endure insults as Jesus did. So don't walk away from your post when the going gets tough. Don't run away from your station when things get overwhelming. Don't leave the battlefield when the fighting becomes fierce. 
lasting change and progress demand the sacrifice of endurance. And in this scripture, we are assured that endurance is how we embrace God's treatment of us as children he loves. And endurance is how we reach the joy that God has for us at the end of our race. So do not lose heart and do not grow weary. The breathtaking views God will give you on top of the mountain are worth all the endurance you must put into climbing that mountain. So I say again, don't give up on your climb. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on your fight. Don't give up on your country. Don't give up on each other. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on me. And if we say that we are really leaders and gatekeepers, we cannot be the first to tell the people we lead that they must give up, that they must no longer practice endurance. As leaders and gatekeepers, we must never be the ones to tell the people God has called us to lead through the wilderness, that because the wilderness is so hot and lonely and dry and there's no water and there's no food, then they must quit and go back to Egypt to be slaves. Our role as gatekeepers and leaders includes training the people we lead to endure and making sure that we ourselves are examples of endurance. I am more persuaded now than ever before that the future we want as a nation is only possible if we help each other endure the present troubles until we overcome them and come out on the other side. And there is no doubt in my mind that we shall overcome. But we must never forget the words that Paul and Barnabas spoke to encourage the gatekeepers and leaders of their time. That, quote, we must endure many hardships and trials to enter the kingdom of God, end of quote. So if you want to see the kingdom of God at work in the gate and realm of influence that you have been placed in, make endurance your friend. God bless you for listening. <laughs>